Hello, I am Dr. Curtis Cornish with the University of Nebraska College of Medicine <coughs> and would like to look at the venous return and cardiac, cardiac output changes that take place during exercise. In preparation for and during exercise, the cardiovascular system undergo, undergoes some important adjustments. They allow the average individual to go from a resting cardiac output of about 5 liters a minute to a cardiac output of about 25 liters a minute. This is due to changes in cardiac function and venous return. In the presentation, we'll be looking at those changes in the two curves to show how this amazing adjustment takes place. To begin with, I should note that uh, when we talk about the cardiac output curve, it is not a true Frank Starling curve because it includes heart rate. For this reason, I will be referring to the cardiac output curve. Uh, not a Frank Starling curve. We will look at, at the changes in the venous return and cardiac output diagram as we go from a resting cardiac output of 5 liters a minute to that scene of 25 liters a minute. Remind you that the y-axis shows us the cardiac output and venous return while the x-axis shows us the right atrial pressure or the preload for the heart. Again, remember that cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. This figure then shows where we at at uh, where we are at at rest. Again, showing that we have a cardiac output of five and a right atrial pressure of about two. The body begins its adjustment to exercise before we actually start exercising. I hope that you remember the experiment that Pavlov performed on the dogs where they began to salivate even before the food was presented, just in response to hearing the bell. The brain starts the adjustment to exercise before the event. In preparation for the activation of the motor cortex, areas in the brain start the process by increasing heart rate and constricting areas in other uh, parts of the body that serve as reservoirs for blood, such as the large veins of the abdomen, the vessels of the skin, and probably other areas as well. At this point, the skin is not involved in the heat loss, and so constriction of it shifts blood centrally. This apparent increase in blood volume shifts the mean systemic filling pressure to the right. Now remember that since this is a parallel shift, or since it's not resistant, the, the shift is parallel. At the same time, the brain anticipates the need to increase blood flow to these muscles that will be exercising. This decreases the resistance in those parts of the body that will be exercising, opening up a lot of parallel vascular beds. However, there is also a decrease in blood flow to the non-exercising tissues. This will increase the resistance in those beds. Because there are more beds that are constricting than dilate, the net, dilating, the net effect is a slight increase in total proof resistance. This then shifts that curve slightly downward. These changes are both due to increases and decreases in sympathetic activity to the various vessels. The sympathetic activity also increases the contractility of the heart and heart rate. This then shifts our rank starting curve, or cardiac output curve, up to upward and to the left. This is now giving us a cardiac output of about 7 liters a minute. Now the real fun begins. All of those changes that got us ready to exercise are increased and added to. The sympathetics further constrict reservoir beds further increasing mean systemic filling pressure. There is also the release of norepinephrine from the various vascular beds, or from the nerves. With the increase in muscle activity, the oxygen content in the tissues decreases, the CO2 content, adenosine, and other metabolites increase in these tissues, causing significant dilation of the vessels in those muscles, opening up a large number of parallel vascular beds. 
at rest there is a very small amount of blood going to the muscle normally and during exercise we get the dilation of all of these which is going to inc or decrease the total peripheral resistance. This then is going to shift this slope upward and to the right. There is also epinephrine being released from the adrenal medulla which augments the cardiac changes. Thus the further increase in heart rate and contractility shift the cardiac output curve upward and to the left. We have now gone from a cardiac output of 5 liters a minute to a cardiac output of 25 liters a minute. Because of the increased ability of the heart to contract or increase in contractility, there is little of any increase in preload. Some have, have suggested that there is a slight increase in preload during exercise, which we see here. If we increase contractility, we change the stroke volume, which is this uh, seen in this pressure uh, volume loop. Looking at this another way, if we increase, uh, during exercise we have an increase in left ventricular diastolic volume, and we have left ventricular systolic volume decreasing. This presentation is obviously very simplistic. There are other factors that contribute significantly to the return of blood to the heart and to the left ventricle. Assuming this is dynamic exercise, the muscle pump is involved in assisting in blood return to the chest. In addition, there is an increase in the depth and rate of breathing. Breathing has been termed the auxiliary pump and assists significantly in returning blood flow to the chest, especially to the left heart. During inspiration, blood is pulled into the uh, lungs and into the right ventricle. With forceful expir expiration, blood is literally squeezed out of the lungs and pushed into the left ventricle, thus improving cardiac performance. It continues to amaze me how often we hear that new researches, research has found some new and amazing thing that exercise does to improve the quality of life and life expectancy. Here are just a few of the benefits that we see from exercise. I think that this cartoon says a lot. What fits you better, your ske busy schedule better? exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day. I've also heard a physician say that you need to either find time for exercise or to find time to be sick. I hope that this has been helpful to you and informative in helping you understand some of the basic concepts of cardiovascular physiology, especially doing exercise.